Hey Optimancers, Chris here. So I want to talk a little bit today about multi-classing of clerics. And the very first thing I want to say is if you want to go straight cleric and not multi-class at all, I think you'll be at least as well off as if you had multi-classed. I don't think that cleric is like one of those classes, like say a paladin, where I think after a certain level, you're actually better off to multi-class than to continue in the main class. I think Cleric actually, right up to the point where they get ninth level spells, has good reason to stay a Cleric. However, I do think there are some multi-classes that can work for Cleric uh, to be at least as good as going straight Cleric, especially for certain character concepts. So today I want to go through the various multi-class options for Clerics, look at the ones that we probably shouldn't do, and the ones that can work out for us if we make the right decisions. So let's get started. So the first class we're going to look at is the Barbarian, and I don't think a Barbarian makes a great class for multi-classing with Cleric, uh, though I do think in certain cases it can work. We are talking about a class that is going to give you 12 hit points plus your Constitution modifier at first level, as well as proficiency in Constitution saves, which can be good for a Cleric. The thing is, is that one of the main abilities of a Barbarian is Rage, and Rage, when we're using it, we can't concentrate on spells. And with a cleric, we have spells we want to be concentrating on. So there is a definite conflict there. Also, when we look at unarmored defense, generally speaking, we're going to be better off wearing armor than we're going to be doing an unarmored defense. So with Barbarian, if we were doing very low levels, so we're not necessarily concentrating on spells all that much, I could see this working, you know, to level three or four, but by level 5 or higher, you're going to find that the lack of being able to use your rage in addition to your best spells is going to be a problem. And so when we're talking about multi-classing, uh, generally speaking, I would say that the Barbarian is not a good choice for Cleric. The next class I want to look at is the Bard. Uh, now, one advantage of multi-classing with a Bard is we would maintain our spell slot progression. Uh, so if you were to take, say, three levels of Bard and five levels of Cleric, you would be casting spells, at least in terms of spell slots, as an eighth level caster. And that can work okay with the Cleric because certain spells, like Spirit Guardians, work really well with scaling. And when we have spells that work really well with scaling, then it is tempting to multi-class various spellcasters. I don't think, however, that Bard is the right class to be looking at if we want to do that. Uh, the first thing is, of course, is the ability scores don't match up. So we're going to have to worry about our wisdom, and we're going to have at least a 13 required charisma score. Now, we can do that. That can be done, but it isn't necessarily easy, and so we need to get a significant benefit from it. And the bard really isn't giving us much benefit. Uh, we get inspiration, which is a great ability, but the problem is it is based on our charisma. We can only use it a number of times equal to our charisma modifier, and we're not going to be able to afford a very good charisma. We may be able to afford enough to multi-class into Bard, but not enough to be able to use inspiration enough times to make it worthwhile. And Bard isn't giving us a lot of other things either. And as we look through the subclasses, there's not a lot of subclasses that are going to give us anything that really makes this worthwhile, in my opinion, for a multi-class. The next class I want to look at is the Druid. Now, the Druid would seem to be the most obvious choice for multi-classing with Cleric. Uh, but there is a significant downside that we need to talk about right away. And that is that a Druid cannot wear armor if it is made of metal. So that means that soon as we multi-class into Druid, then we can no longer wear our best armor. And that's one of the big advantages of playing a Cleric, is that you're playing a full Spellcaster who also has full armor. Uh, so we have to give that up in order to multi-class Druid. There are some certain advantages, though, to multi-classing Druid. Uh, the first one is that there are certain Druid spells that can work really well with Cleric abilities. Uh, specifically, if we're talking about the Life Cleric, the Life Cleric gets a bonus to healing spells. Specifically, if we're talking about a Life Cleric, Life Cleric at level 1 gets Disciple of Life. Uh, and what it does is, if we use a spell of first level or higher to restore hit points to a creature, the creature regains additional hit points 
equal to 2 plus the spell's level. That doesn't have to be a cleric spell. It can be any spell that provides healing. Uh, so that would include things like healing spirit. And healing spirit plus disciple of life is just crazy. Now, when it comes to something like Goodberry, now Goodberry gives you 10 individual berries that each heal one hit point. I've often looked at the wording and determined, is Goodberry really restoring hit points or is it creating an item that can restore hit points? Because, you know, we could cast something like a creation spell to create a healing kit and somebody with a healer feat could then restore hit points with that healer kit. Does that mean the spell is restoring hit points? And so I wasn't entirely sure whether Disciple of Life would work with Goodberry, but according to the designers, they say it would. Uh, that means that a Goodberry spell, that's a first level Druid spell, would heal three additional hit points with every berry. So that means we would get a first level spell that could restore 40 hit points of damage. Again, just an incredible synergy there. Uh, well worth considering this multi-class. Uh, now, if I was to do that, I would say that we might just want to dip Cleric. We might just want one level of life Cleric and then go ahead with Druid uh, because we're giving up that armor just at that first level of Druid, so we might as well get some of the benefits of Druid as well. However, if we did want to go primarily Cleric, this could still work. I would say even three levels of Druid uh, would give us Goodberry. It would give us Healing Spirit. We could scale Healing Spirit using our Cleric slots, uh, but we do give up that armor class that we would be getting with the armor. So that is something to consider. But there is another advantage with going with a Cleric Druid, uh, and that is Spirit Guardians. Now, it is nice to think that we could do a wild shape and then be a bear running around with Spirit Guardians, and that sounds cool. The problem with it is that Generally, wild shapes don't have great armor class. And if we don't have a great armor class, that means we're going to be hit with more attacks. If we're hit with more attacks, that means more concentration saves, which means a greater chance of our spirit guardians going down. But there are certain things we can do to boost our concentration save. We could get resilient constitution. We might dip a class that would give us constitution saves right at level one. We might get the Warcaster feat. Uh, there's lots of things we can do that could really boost up our concentration saves. We can also choose certain wild shapes that might have a better armor class and therefore be able to take less damage, which means less concentration saves. Now, the reason why I think this is worthy of considering is because of the way Spirit Guardians interacts with us when we increase our size. Uh, so here we see a cleric and the cleric is cast Spirit Guardians, we can see that it extends for 15 feet around them. And I had a comment in another video asking if Spirit Guardians was a 15 foot radius, and therefore would it in fact do 15 feet all around us, and thus do seven by seven squares, or if it should be doing six by six squares. But the Spirit Guardian spell is not a 15 foot radius spell. It says specifically that it extends 15 feet around you. So therefore, if you cast it as a medium-sized cleric, you can expect a seven by seven area of effect. And if we take out our own square from that, that means there's 48 squares of effect that we might catch enemies in. Now let's say that we turn into a large size spider, so a giant spider. This is a CR1 creature. A moon druid could do this at level two. Well, now as a large size creature, Soon as we do that 15 foot area, you can see it's now an eight by eight effect. That's 64 squares. And if we remove the area that we're taking up, that's 60 squares. So we're talking about 12 additional squares, a bigger effect. With Spirit Guardians, this is especially good because remember we can exclude creatures we see like our companions from the effect. Now, should we go to higher levels? With the Moon Druid, we could easily get to challenge rating two creatures if we get to six levels in Druid. If we did that, we could do something like a giant snake. Now we're into huge size. Now we're talking about nine by nine squares. That's 81 squares minus the nine. Uh, that would be 72 squares of enemy and so on. You can even get to gargantuan creatures eventually. So that is a consideration if we are multi-classing Cleric and Druid. And if we are, then I would say that we definitely want to get at least five levels of Cleric to get that Spirit Guardians going. And it also means that something like a Moon Druid is especially good when combined with Cleric. 
uh, but I don't see the same benefit from any of the other Druid subclasses. The next class I want to talk about is the Fighter. Now, one thing, if we do Fighter at level 1, we're going to get our proficiency in Constitution saving throws, which is always good, uh, because we're going to be making Concentration saves. But, like with the Barbarian, if we take Fighter, our spells are going to suffer, and our spell slots are going to suffer. Now, what we could do is if we were to take three levels of Fighter, we could get Eldritch Knight, that would give us effectively one level of increased spell casting. So if you were playing, say, a fifth level cleric, third level fighter, that was an Eldritch Knight, you'd be casting spells as a sixth level caster. And one nice thing about doing something like Eldritch Knight is we can get things like spells like Shield. And Shield, of course, is something that a cleric can't get a hold of. They have reactions available. Uh, so Shield would be a great addition to a cleric spell list. Also, of course, whenever we multi-class uh, fighter, we automatically think of level 2 and action surge and how well that works with everything, and it works well with clerics as well. So with an action surge, for example, we could do things like we could raise our spirit guardians and then maybe use our channel divinity in the same turn. Now, personally, I would not be interested in doing something like using an action surge to get an extra melee attack with a cleric. I don't think that's going to be a lot of value for us compared to the other things we can do. I'd be looking at Channel Divinities or Spellcasting. Also keep in mind, on any turn that you cast something like Spiritual Weapon that uses a bonus action, then any action you take that turn to cast a spell can only cast a cantrip. So using Action Surge on the round you cast Spiritual Weapon, not a good idea. Now one class that might seem like it's obvious is the Monk. And that is because the monk and the cleric are both wisdom-based classes. So you would think that monk would work really well. But it really, nothing works together here. The monk is not increasing our spellcasting. It's not giving us constitution saving throws. Uh, martial arts uses up our bonus action. We want to use our bonus action for things like spiritual weapon. Unarmored defense isn't as good as wearing armor. Uh, so we're going to want to wear armor. So monk just doesn't really give us anything here. So... I monk cleric, I don't think it works together well at all. Now one thing I'll mention about monk is that if we are to do a more complicated build, uh, monk actually works reasonably well with something like, say, a druid wild shape. So if we were doing something like monk and druid and then putting cleric on top of that, then maybe we could make something work with that. The next class I want to talk about is the paladin. Now the paladin, the first thing to note is paladin is going to require strength and Charisma, each of 13, in order to multi-class to or from Paladin. But if we were to take Paladin for, say, two levels, then what we could do is we could use our Clerical Spells to fuel Smites. And that is kind of the primary reason why you would consider doing a Paladin with a Cleric build. Now, if we were to carry on Paladin to, say, six levels, we would get the advantage of getting that bonus to our saving throws. The problem with that is... I wouldn't expect to have an amazing charisma with a Paladin Cleric multiclass unless we're focusing on Paladin. If we're focusing on Cleric, we're probably going to want to focus on our Wisdom. That means our charisma is not going to be all that high. That means that that bonus at level 6 isn't going to be that high, and it's probably not worth taking that many levels. But if we were, say, focusing on Paladin, instead we're going to take a little bit of Cleric, Something like five levels of Cleric to get Spirit Guardians and then continuing with Paladin might be an option. Or maybe six levels of Paladin, five levels of Cleric, and then move into something like Sorcerer or a Hexblade Dip. Now, if we're talking about Paladins and Clerics multiclassing, one thing we should also talk about is Channel Divinity. Uh, because Channel Divinity has specific rules within multiclassing rules in the Player's Handbook. And that is, number one, they don't stack. So if you have a first level cleric and a third level paladin, you would normally have a channel divinity from your cleric, channel divinity from your paladin, but you don't, you only get one channel divinity. The advantage is, is that you can use your channel divinity for either one. Now a paladin only ever gets one channel divinity, but a cleric does get multiple channel divinities. When a cleric gets to sixth level, they get a second channel divinity, and then they get a third channel divinity at very high level. I wouldn't worry about that, but at sixth level, that is easily achievable. We could get a second channel divinity. And there's certain paladin channel divinities that are really good. So if, for example, uh, you were primarily focused on paladin, but you wanted to take maybe six levels of cleric, uh, then you could get 
the second channel divinity, and if you were, say, something like a Conquest Paladin that has a great third level channel divinity option, you could do it twice instead of once. Uh, overall, I think it's probably a bad deal because we're getting less channel divinities. We're essentially giving one up. Uh, but if we were to multi-class them and I wanted to make the most of my channel divinities, I'd be making sure that at least either the clerical option or the paladin option had a really good channel divinity. But I don't necessarily have to worry about both. If I have uh, one that's good and one that's bad, then I'm just going to do the one that's good. Uh, so I'm not so worried about having them be both good. So paladin can work with cleric. Uh, but there is a bit of complication there. We're going to get into specific build options later, and I'll talk some more about Paladin. Now, Ranger is a very unpopular class in D&D, but I do think Ranger and Cleric make a wonderful combination. Uh, first off, when we're talking about the ability scores, there's no problem. Ranger needs a Dexterity of 13 and a Wisdom of 13, and then a cleric requires the wisdom of 13. So as long as we're playing a cleric that is somewhat dexterity based, ranger can really work well. Now, if I was going to go with ranger, I'd be looking at taking five levels, get that extra attack and get gloom stalker because the gloom stalker subclass gives amazing abilities that are good pretty much on any build, but especially on a wisdom based build. You're going to get dread ambusher and umbral sight both at level three. Uh, Dread Ambusher will give you a bonus equal to your Wisdom modifier to initiative rolls. As a Cleric, we're going to be Wisdom focused, so we can expect that's probably going to start at a plus 3, and eventually it's going to be a plus 5 to our initiative score. In addition, on the first turn of each combat, our walking speed increases by 10 feet. This is good for Clerics, can help get us into range for those good spells. Uh, and finally, when we take the attack action on our first turn, we can make an additional weapon attack as part of that action. So it's an extra weapon attack we get in addition to our increased speed, in addition to the initiative bonus. And finally, if the attack hits, it does an extra D8 damage. So more damage, more attacks, higher movement speed, and initiative bonuses. That's just one ability that the Gloomstalker gets. The other ability they get at level 3, Umbral Sight, might even be better. First thing it does is it gives us a dark vision of 60 feet. If we already have dark vision, it increases by 30 feet. So then it becomes a 90 foot dark vision. But the big thing here is uh, we're adept at evading creatures that rely on dark vision. So while we're in darkness, we're considered invisible to any creature that relies on dark vision to see you in darkness. What that is, is essentially, if you're in darkness, you're treated as having improved invisibility to anyone who's trying to perceive you with dark vision. Improved invisibility is an amazing effect that would normally require concentration. If we have a Gloomstalker Ranger and we can be in a fight in darkness, we're going to get that for free, no concentration required. So if we combine that then with extra attack at level 5, uh, we can do quite a bit with a Gloomstalker Ranger slash Cleric. And keep in mind that a Ranger is going to be giving half their level in terms of increasing spell slots. So if we're multi-classing, say, a 5th level Cleric with a 5th level Ranger, they would be casting spells as a 7th level caster. So they would have 4th level slots. That means you could upcast your Spirit Guardians to a 4th level slot. The next class I want to talk about is the Rogue. Uh, now, with the Rogue, generally, I wouldn't consider more than a single level of Rogue. Uh, and I would do it at a dip at 1st level. If we dip Rogue at first level, it's going to give us a few things. We're going to get expertise and a couple skills. We're going to get two additional skills known, and we're going to get a sneak attack of 1d6. Now we're going to be giving up some spell casting in order to do that. The reason I wouldn't take Rogue to second level is then the cunning action ability, although I think it's a really good ability, it also uses up our bonus action and there's conflict there. Again, we're going to want to be doing things like spiritual weapon that's going to be using our bonus action potentially every round. Uh, so we won't be able to combine that with cunning action. Now, Rogue requires a dexterity of 13, so this is something I would consider if I was playing a cleric with medium armor proficiency. One thing I hear about a lot is if you did want to play a tricky cleric so that they're kind of roguish, a one-level dip in Rogue is kind of the answer. It's going to give you the skills you need, it's going to give you the sneak attack, it's going to give you the expertise. Uh, and then when you go into Cleric, uh, we're already going to be able to use the weapon we need, the rapier. Uh, so you could play that style of Cleric as long as you dipped Rogue at level 1. Again, with the Rogue, like many of the other martial classes, we're giving up that level of spell casting, and that hurts a little bit. 
Now, what about the Sorcerer? So the Sorcerer, I talked about the Bard already. As a full caster, you get the advantage that you are going to increase your spell slots as if you had gone straight class. And that is good. Uh, now, the thing I like about the Sorcerer over something like the Bard is we're going to have a Constitution saving throw proficiency, which means if we take Sorcerer at level 1, we're going to have that proficiency. That means better concentration saves. Now, as I go through the Sorcerer subclasses, the one that jumps out to me is definitely Divine Soul. And the reason I'd be interested in Divine Soul is because of their first level ability, Favored by the Gods. Uh, what this does is if we miss a saving throw or an attack roll, we can roll 2d4 and add it to the total, potentially changing the outcome. Obviously, I'm thinking about concentration saves. So I've got my Spirit Guardians up, I used my highest level slot for it, I took damage, and I happened to roll bad, and I didn't make it my concentration save, that 2d4 could be a lifesaver. Now again with a Sorcerer, we have to have that 13 Charisma score. Uh, and what I'd be looking at if I'm making a Sorcerer Cleric is I'd be dipping one level of Sorcerer right at level 1. And I would only worry about having that 13 Charisma just to qualify. Uh, and that is not going to be your best character at level 1. But at level 2, once we multi-class into Cleric, we'll be fine. But if I was going to play in a campaign where I expected to be level 1 for a significant period of time, I don't want to play a 13 Charisma Sorcerer. Uh, so that is only the kind of thing I do is if either we're making a character that's going to start at level 2 or higher, or we're going to be progressing past level 1 very quickly, like hopefully in one session. Now let's look at the Warlock. Now one thing about the Warlock is their spellcasting works differently when we multi-class. So if we multi-class Cleric and Warlock, those spell slots are calculated separately. Uh, so they don't combine like every other class in the game. That means that we're not going to be able to use our Warlock slots for something like Spirit Guardians or to be able to upcast any spells. Uh, the only way we could do that is if we were to take five levels of Warlock. We probably don't want to do that. The other thing is, of course, Eldritch Blast is always a major point of taking Warlock, but because we're going to be a Wisdom-based caster, that doesn't work out all that well for us uh, because we're going to be using the wrong ability score in order to hit with it and the damage bonuses with it if we have something like Agonizing Blast. But a one level dip in Warlock is worth considering. There's two reasons for this. Uh, the first reason is the spell Armor of Agathis. So Armor of Agathis is available to any Warlock, regardless of your subclass, and it would be an obvious pick for me if I was going to multi-class into Cleric uh, because Armor of Agathis scales amazingly, and it is a great addition to a cleric, and it doesn't require concentration, so it isn't something that's going to be conflicting with the other spells we're going to be casting. Uh, so I could see taking the one level Warlock dip just to get access to Armor of Agathis so that I could upcast it later. On its own, I don't think that's worthwhile. But the other thing I might consider Warlock for is if we went into Hexblade, and that's for Hexblade Curse. Uh, so at first level, a Hexblade gets a Hexblade's Curse, and what it happens is you use your bonus action, you choose one creature you can see within 30 feet of you, and that target's cursed for one minute. Now keep in mind, this is not a spell, so on the round we cast Spirit Guardians, we could use the Hexblade Curse, and it's not going to affect our ability to cast Spirit Guardians, and it's not going to interfere with our casting of Spiritual Weapon on the following round. So it fits in actually really nicely. Uh, now, what Hexblade Curse gives you is a bonus on damage rolls against the cursed target, and the bonus equals our proficiency bonus. That means it doesn't rely on our charisma at all. And a cleric, unlike a lot of other classes, is delivering damage from many different avenues. We're delivering damage through Spirit Guardians, we're delivering damage through Spiritual Weapon, we're delivering damage through our melee attacks or our cantrips. Potentially three times a round we're doing damage, uh, and with Hexblade Curse, that means we'd be getting that bonus three times around. And again, because it's based on a proficiency bonus, not on our Charisma bonus, uh, it is going to scale with our level and deliver more damage every round as we go up in level. That's really quite good. We can do a Hexblade Curse with every short rest. Uh, so whenever we're fighting something that's really big and tough, a Hexblade Curse with a Cleric fits just really nicely, really easily, really effectively. The next class I want to talk about is the wizard. Now the wizard, again, doesn't seem like an obvious choice, but like with a sorcerer, like with a bard, 
we get the advantage that we are going to be increasing our spell slots as if we had gone straight cleric, uh, which means that when we have spells that scale, like Spirit Guardians, wizard levels or more cleric levels makes no difference. Now, just like Bard or Sorcerer, we're dealing with an ability score that probably wouldn't have been our primary score. So in this case, you need an intelligence score of at least 13 to qualify for wizard. Wizard also isn't giving us constitution saving throw proficiency like a sorcerer is, but there are a couple reasons why I consider wizard, and in each case, I'd probably be looking at multiple levels of wizard. Uh, the first is, if I'm playing a Tempest Cleric, the multiclass I hear about all the time is the Storm Sorcerer. Now, I understand that Storm Sorcerer, Tempest Cleric that deals in thunder and lightning sound like they are the perfect combination. But if we look at the abilities of the Storm Sorcerer, they don't really mesh all that well with Tempest Cleric. We're not getting all that many lightning spells with any caster. We are getting like a free disengage when we cast, but really not much more than that. Wizard, I think, offers a lot more, and that's if we go with Evoker, because a lot of these evocation spells we're casting, like our Shatter, uh, or if we are multiclassing to get spells like Lightning Bolt, they're going to have friendly fire. And if we can avoid the friendly fire, like an evoker can, that can mean more targets getting hit by our maximized effect. So laying down a shatter that is maximized is reasonably good. But if we can lay down a shatter that is maximized and can ignore friendly fire, that is so much better because we can often hit many more enemies. One thing to keep in mind, though, is if we're thinking of taking two levels of evoker and then going with cleric, then we're going to end up with spells like Call Lightning. And Call Lightning is a conjuration spell, not an evocation spell, which means it doesn't qualify for the Evoker Sculpt spells. If we're doing that combination, I'd say you're better off doing the two levels of Tempest Cleric and then going straight with Wizard. The other Wizard multiclass I'd consider strongly is the War Mage, because the War Mage gives you that ability where you can use your reaction to get a plus four to any saving throw. That's huge on any class where you really want to boost your saving throws, and Cleric is one of those classes. So two levels of War Mage on top of a Cleric, especially if we did, say, five levels of Cleric, and then we dipped for two levels of Wizard and got War Mage, that would mean that we wouldn't slow down our progression of Spirit Guardians at all, and we would have a plus four bonus to our concentration save when we needed it, as well as a bonus to all the other saving throws we make as well. Also, we're adding things like the Shield spell, uh, Find Familiar spell, really nice boons for a Cleric build. The final class we're going to talk about is the Artificer. This is an Eberron class, uh, though it is sometimes allowed in other uh, campaign worlds, so we should talk about it. Uh, if we take a Artificer for one level, it will improve our spell slot progression as if we had taken a full caster. Uh, that's just one of the unique features of an Artificer is, although it's a half caster, if you take only one level, you still get that full level of spell casting progression. That means one level Artificer as a dip is pretty tempting. It's going to give us our Constitution saving throw proficiency. It ends up with a very similar synergy to Sorcerer. Uh, in really no case can I really see taking Artificer beyond level 2. And level 2, I could really only see if any of those infused items that an Artificer gets are really attractive to you, maybe in a low magic campaign setting. Otherwise, a one level Artificer dip uh, gives us a similar benefit to one level in Sorcerer. So let's talk about some multi-class builds that I think might be effective. The first one I want to talk about is Moon Druid 2 and then Straight Cleric. So I already talked about how this affects our Spirit Guardians. But one thing we could do to that, because I talked a little bit about armor class and how that can be an issue, is we could actually add one level of Monk right at level 1. So if we did Monk 1, then Moon Druid 2, and then Straight Cleric after that, we would get the advantage of being able to do a large size creature with our Spirit Guardians, thus affecting a greater area. But we'd also get the advantage that Unarmored Defense would give us on top of the Wild Shape that the Moon Druid did. Because although I mentioned when we talked about Monks that Unarmored Defense is not as good as Armor, I'm not changing that, it's not as good as Armor, it is better than no Armor. And that's what you're doing when you get a Moon Druid and you Wild Shape. Now, when we look at Unarmored Defense for a Monk, combined with a Moon Druid, uh, 
keep in mind that any natural armor of the creature you don't get. You're only going to get your wisdom modifier plus the creature's dexterity modifier. That will be your new armor class. Uh, but if we're doing something like that large spider we talked about, then suddenly we're talking about a 16 dexterity. That's a plus three dexterity and a 16 probably starting wisdom. That's a plus three wisdom. That means we would have a 16 armor class with that giant spider. 16 armor class isn't amazing, but for a wild shape, it's actually pretty amazing. It's not a terrible armor class. Combine that with something like a variant human getting Warcaster feet, so we get advantage on those constitution saving throws. Uh, and then once we get Cleric 5, we're talking about an 8th level Cleric that could cast a 4th level Spirit Guardians that would cover a greater area and be pretty hard to drop. So that's a combination I think could work out okay. Second combination that I think could work out is if we went with Favored Soul Sorcerer 1, Hexblade Warlock 1, and then Straight Cleric. The advantage of this build is we would only be behind one level in spellcasting, and we would have more first level slots because we can use our Warlock slots, of course, uh, and our Favored Soul Sorcerer would give us our Constitution saving throw, it would give us our Shield spell, uh, and it would give us favor to the gods so we could further boost our concentration saves when we need to. Hexblade Warlock would give us our Hexblade Curse and Armor of Agathis, and then we could go straight Cleric after that. And I think that would not only have a great saving throw for constitution and for concentration saves, but it would also deliver more damage than your average Cleric because of Hexblade Curse. Now, if we wanted to go uh, instead with an intelligence-based build, I think we could do something pretty interesting if we went Artificer 1, War Mage Wizard 2, and then Straight Cleric. The advantage of this over the previous build is there's no loss of spellcast progression at all. We have full spellcasting progression here. We have constitution saving throws. We're going to have a plus four on any saving throw we need. We're going to have access to spells like Shield and Find Familiar. So this really could work out nicely as well. The next one I want to talk about is if we want to concentrate a little bit more on melee, we could do Favored Soul Sorcerer 1, Paladin 2, and then Cleric. Uh, so Favored Soul Sorcerer 1 would give us our Constitution saving throws and Blessing of the Gods to further improve our Concentration saving throws. Then Paladin 2 would give us our ability to smite. Uh, so we could use our spell slots that we're getting through Sorcerer and Cleric in order to fuel our smites. And then our Cleric in order to get things like Spirit Guardians, etc. The next multi-class I think is pretty good is if we went with Eldritch Knight 3 and then straight into Forge Cleric after that. And what I'd be looking at here is if I wanted to get an, a Cleric that had the best possible defense, I think this would be an interesting way to go uh, because Eldritch Knight 3 would give us our, things like our shield spell. We could take the defensive combat style, add it with a Forge Cleric's ability to magically enhance their armor uh, and the other defensive abilities that I talked about in the subclass video. This combination would be a defensive marvel. The next one I kind of talked about before is Gloomstalker 5 and then go into Cleric, but go into Life Cleric. Because one thing about the Ranger that I didn't mention before was that a Ranger also gets Good Berry, and a Ranger also gets Healing Spirit. And a 5th level Ranger gets both of those. So if we went Gloomstalker 5, we're getting all those great advantages that I talked about with Gloomstalker. Yet we're also getting all those great advantages I talked about when multiclassing a Life Cleric and a Druid, and we're not having the armor restriction that we would have multi-classing Druid and Cleric. So I do think Gloomstalker 5 and Life Cleric can be better, just straight better, than going with a Druid Cleric in order to get that advantage. So what if we want to play the character that is going to need the Charisma or the Intelligence ability scores in order to do the multi-classing? How would we work with our ability scores? Well, first thing, if we're going to play a Cleric that is going to need Charisma, such as a sorcerer or warlock multi-class, uh, then I would really look at the half-elf. Just because we're getting that plus two bonus to charisma, but we still can get a plus one bonus to wisdom and a plus one bonus to our constitution or our dexterity or strength, uh, depending on the kind of armor we're planning to wear. So even with a standard array, we could make this work. 
you would put the 15 in your wisdom, which would become a 16. We would put a 13 in our constitution, which would become a 14. Dexterity of 14, which we could combine with medium armor. Then we would have a charisma of 12, which would become a 14, which would meet our multi-class requirements. And then an intelligence of 10 and a strength of 8. So it's actually really easy to make that work if we take half health. Uh, so then when we do that multi-class, not hard at all. Now, if we needed to do, say, intelligence, like, for example, if we were going to do artificer or wizard, uh, it's a little bit harder because we're not going to get that great bonus with the half elf because that plus two charisma isn't doing us any good. So I'd be looking at races that give bonuses to wisdom, intelligence, constitution, and or dexterity. Uh, and you can still make it work, but you probably are going to need a point by. So if we were going to play something like, let's say, a wood elf, uh, we could make this work. We'd have a wisdom score of 15, would become 16, intelligence score of 14, high enough, constitution of 14, dexterity of 12, which would become 14, strength of 8, charisma of 8. So those multi-class restrictions, they're not easy to get around, but we can do it. Uh, and generally what we'd be looking at is we're looking at probably having a 14 in either dexterity or our strength, depending on the kind of armor we expect to wear. Uh, that means that this kind of cleric tends to not be as effective if we're going to play a melee cleric. We're probably going to be better off if we're playing a cantrip cleric. If we were playing a melee cleric, uh, essentially you would be stuck with a 14 strength. I don't really see a way around that unless we were going to be having a wisdom score of less than 16 to start or a constitution score of less than 14 to start. Neither of those would I recommend. So that is all the multiclassing I think works really well with Cleric. It's also all the multiclassing I don't think works really well with Cleric. Uh, and so if we're going to play a Cleric, uh, something to think about if you want a multiclass. What is the advantages of that multiclass and is it worth what you're giving up? Uh, now, again, if you're not sure about it, I recommend going straight cleric. There's no build I talked about here that I think is better than cleric straight from level one. Uh, some of them will be better at higher levels than a cleric. Uh, some might even be better at lower levels than a cleric, but cleric is always going to have advantage at some levels if they just go straight class. So if in doubt, just go straight class cleric. It's not one of the greatest classes for multi-classing. But if you do want to multi-class, if you don't want to play the same cleric every time, those are some ideas as ways to make a cleric reasonably effective through a multi-class. So I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any multi-class ideas that I didn't consider, please let me know in the comments down below. Otherwise, until next time, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, Optimancers. See you next week. Mm -hmm.